all, my name is John. Thank you very much for coming to listen to my talk. Uh, I'd like to talk about events. The question for this talk is, what is an event? How do events happen, and what is the relation between events and the world that we can see? Is there something we can understand about events that can help us become better human beings, which is why, um, which is why everyone is here, I assume. From the dictionary, an event is something that happens or takes place, for example, running a Python program. The dictionary also says an event is a countable noun, which I will come back to. Firstly, let's very quickly think about what happens when we run a Python program. How many events can we find? When we run a Python program, the program statement is converted into bytecode. That's an event. You can tell it happened because of those PYC files. When the bytecode is executed, the machine code is executed, causing transistors to change state lots of times. On the level of the Python program, though, functions are called, attributes are assigned, values are returned, and so on. Each of those things is something that happens or takes place. It's an event. Of course, when writing Python software, explicit is better than implicit. If we want to be explicit about something happening, we might use the name event. For example, the Python threading module and other things have an object class called event. One thread signals an event is set, and one or more other threads waiting for it with wait. In a web application, you might have an object model or a domain model with a database table for each class to store model object records. The general idea is that when you make changes to a model object, then a record is updated in the database. New values take the place of old values. Each change is a real event, but if we are updating model object records, we aren't being explicit that <coughs> model changes are events. Which is fine unless you want to propagate the state of the application. Which is fine unless you want to propagate the state of an application, for example, into a search index. Then you need both to update model object records and also send a message. However, if the model object records are committed first, and then the system crashes, um, then the message will not be sent. And if the message is sent first and the system crashes, the model object records will not be updated. Both of those outcomes, the model records but not the message, and the message but not the records, are events that we don't really want to happen. The situation is made worse if you send the message using an AMP system like RabbitMQ because the message delivery is not guaranteed to be in order. What we want to happen is for everything to happen or for nothing to happen. In other words, we want what happens to be atomic, irreducible, indivisible. That is, we want the real event of storing the records and sending the message to be atomic. But we can't make it atomic unless we use distributed transactions in the case where we're sending something off to the system. And we don't want to use distributed transactions for various reasons. So what can we do? Let's see what happens when we make these model changes explicit and code for the model events and write those events to database records. That's basically what we call event sourcing. With event sourcing, the state of an application is determined by a sequence of events. Once a model event happens, it never changes. We say the model events are immutable. A common example of event sourcing is accounting ledgers. Be it an ancient papyrus ledger or your online banking application, the idea is that you record the transactions and sum them to obtain the balance. You don't just keep overwriting the balance and forget about the transactions. It's a good example of event sourcing because everybody is familiar with financial transactions. Obviously, you don't want your bank to just update your balance and forget about the transactions. What would you do if the balance was wrong? It's said that everything you want to know about event sourcing can be learned from accountants because accounting is inherently event sourced. But many other domains, such as law and medicine and so on, are fundamentally event sourced also. I can show you some Python code for event sourcing. Here's a table for storing events. It's, this is an SQL alchemy 
definition is the screen is not so big and it's a bit below and so it's not so easy to see. And this is the advanced version anyway, I think it's slightly the simple version. Um, so it shows event records can be placed in a separate sequence for each model object. So that's the originator ID. The originator ID distinguishes between model object sequences. The originator version is the position in a model object sequence of events. Topic, the event type there, sorry. Um, the event type represents um, the event type represents the, the topic represents the type of the event. We just coded it as type here in the slide, and so right. And the event state represents the attribute values of the event. To obtain a model object in its current state, we get the event records rather than the model object records, and replay them through uh, projections to um, derive the, the current state. Uh, and since the entire state of the application is determined by a sequence of events, we can propagate the state of the application by propagating the events. But how can the events be propagated in a reliable way? As the dictionary says, events is a countable noun, so we can use counting to give each event an integer notification ID. Now the event is in two sequences. So that's the notification ID there. Now the event is in two sequences. We need this placing of the event in two sequences to be an irreducible event in our process, which means the event and the notification information must be written to the database in an atomic transaction. It's the atomic recording that makes the process event atomic, which forces the infrastructure to give us everything or nothing. This is reliable because counting is reliable and database transactions are reliable. We can also use counting to follow the sequence. The position in the sequence can be tracked so we know which is the next one. The received event might be consumed by updating a materialized view. So long as the tracking information and any information created by handling the event are recorded atomically, a sequence of events can be projected reliably. We can take this further. We can combine projection and propagation in the same application. An application can respond to an event by generating further events. So long as the tracking information the new model events and the new notifications are recorded together in the same atomic transaction. The processing of the event either happens or it doesn't happen. This technique gives us atomic exactly once processing. We can make a distributed system that is determinate using this technique. It is reliable because counting is reliable and atomic database transactions are reliable. This technique has no need for reordering, deduplication, or identity operations. In this design, the event processing is a sequence of processing events, each of which consumes the next unprocessed domain event for an input sequence and, according to a policy, creates zero or many domain events that it puts in an output sequence. The output sequence can be consumed in a similar way. Um, uh, I've got an example which I could show you perhaps at the end, I just didn't slide it up, so I think I've got an orders reservation payment system that uses the event sourcing library that I developed over the past few years. Um, the events are propagated from the orders application to the reservations application and so on, back from the reservations to the orders, from the orders to the payments, and back from the payments to the orders, so you can get a process running through this distributed system like that, so it's totally reliable. The entire system of applications is defined independent, can be defined independently in the infrastructure. We can run it synchronously with the library can define this without infrastructure and then run it as a single thread synchronously, which is great for development and stepping through the behaviors. And then you can run it asynchronously with multiple operating system processes. Um, the behavior is the same. Um, there's another example, which I also haven't put on the slide, about Paxos showing that you can you know, um, use this thing to invoke the Paxos protocol to come to consensus in distributed system in a very reliable way with a key value in pair. And perhaps just stick to point on those and show them right. Um, uh, because we can identify the domain model events and the process events, we are eight because so we identify the domain model events from the changes in the model and we store those which is useful. But if we look at what's happening with us, that storing of those events, that's an event itself. Um, which I call in processing event or process event. 
we are able to design for those events and make a generic design for reliable distributed systems that, when it can run at all, actually behaves in the way we want it to behave. <laughs> The important point is there is a difference between an occasion in which something happens and a remnant or enduring fact from that occasion. In 1929, a guy called Alfred North Whitehead published a book called Protest and Reality. It marks an important turning point in the history of philosophy. He affirmed that, in fact, everything is an event. Events, occasions of experience, are the real entities. The world, he says, is made of events, and nothing but events. Happenings rather than things, verbs rather than nouns, processes rather than substances. Even a seemingly solid and permanent object is an event, or better, a multiplicity and a series of events. Whitehead suggests that becoming is the deepest dimension of being, Creativity is the universal of universals. Becoming draws on facts and creatively brings something new into existence. A new fact, a new event. He wrote, the world, the actual world is built up of actual occasions. Whatever things there are in any sense of existence are derived by abstraction from actual occasions. I shall use the term event in the more general sense of a nexus of actual occasions. A nexus is, according to Whitehead, a particular fact of togetherness among actual entities. When the elements of a nexus are united by a defining characteristic that is common to all of them, and that they have all inherited from one another, or acquired by a common process, then Whitehead calls it a society. A society is self-sustaining. Self In other words, it is its own reason. The actual things, the real actual things to endure, and that we encounter in everyday experience are all societies. Whitehead sometimes also calls them enduring objects. A building is, an, is a society or an enduring object. For that matter, so am I myself. Feelings are also events. Subjective feelings are private facts. Whitehead suggests our feelings are important because they're the only things that we have that are not abstract. We emerge from the world Whitehead wrote, we essentially arise out of our bodies, which are the stubborn facts of the immediate rather than past. We are also carried on by our immediate past of personal experience. We finish a sentence because we have begun it. No event comes into being out of nothing, rather it inherits its data from past occasions. Each actual occasion is self-creating by virtue of the novel way in which it treats these pre-existing dates or prior occasions, hence no occasion is the same as any other. Each occasion introduces something new into the world. This means that each occasion, taken in itself, is a quantum, a discrete and <coughs> divisible unit of becoming. But this also means that occasions are strictly limited in scope. Once an occasion happens, it is already over, already dead. Once it has reached its final satisfaction, it no longer has any vital power. An actual occasion never changes, Whitehead said. It only becomes and perishes. And a perished occasion subsists only as a datum a sort of raw material that any subsequent occasion may take up in its own turn in order to transform it in a new process of self-creation. This also shows how production works. Production is determined by consumption with recording. All process is eventual. In the Python example, the atomic recording of the process event information determines the atoms of the process in just the way you want. I guess that's also why Agile methods tend to emphasize small commits, <coughs> continuous integration, frequent releases, and time box iterations. The creative becoming of software developers becomes an event only when these recordings are made. Otherwise, at the end of the day, there are no records. Effectively, nothing in particular happens. And so it turns out the world is effectively event source. It's just that the universe, it's not that the universe replays the whole of history each time you make an observation. But it is like eternity is a ball surrounded by uh, it's like eternity is a ball surrounded by the void of the time to come, with the present distributed around its surface. Events burst into the void of the time to come, augmenting being. So with that in mind, 
let's turn our attention to our human processes. We emerge from the world, but then we enter into particular social worlds, like the world of Python. So let's think briefly about social occasions of experience, social events. A piece of software is the remnant of occasions of software development. If I check out a branch of a repository, I may get a sequence of changes applied to an empty folder, but what actually happens or needs to happen to leave us with working software? Before the world illuminates <coughs> all the suggestions about how to do it better, the way to design computers and make software was to use creativity. We can all use our creativity to make software, but that's exactly the time when we start using creativity also to invent tools and techniques for working together, such as planning and pairing, refactoring, test-driven development, domain-driven design, event storming, and so on. Good suggestions are intended to improve rather than displace creativity. According to Whitehead, a piece of working software and a necklace of facts must have a particular fact of togetherness. The various agile descriptions, for example, the meetings of Scrum and the techniques of XP, are the results of enormously creative events. It also takes great creativity to develop that know-how for yourself. Hence, we all have different practices. When we work together, we work across our unavoidable differences and somehow come together in order to make something work. The human processes that bring people to use our software are just the same. This seems to require special attention. I just wonder, when it comes to developing software together, do we sometimes botch these human process development events? Why do so many software development managers seem so sure that after saying Scrum, there is nothing to discuss? In the opinion of James Greening, one of the signatories of the Agile Manifesto, sprinting is easy to enforce, enforce, stop all to enforce, much of the supporting stuff to make it possible to be successful is ignored. In general, how do we make a social <coughs> event a human process? <coughs> it's the call to play street cricket, the manual for burger flipping in the multinational chain, the invitation to a party, standing orders to controlling a nuclear submarine, a business contract. There are differences in, there are differences in style and content, but in each case, there's a description that functions as a proposal to which others can lend their informed consent. If we have a fundamental approach to developing a human process, it seems to start with a description and end with a new event, perhaps voiced by a parent, friend or coach, or taken from a book or from memory, we use descriptions to develop what we can do. When we become capable, we use descriptions to propose agreements, objections and improvements with others. Our creativity depends on our feelings, but we are all held together by words. Humans use language to make shared events from our individual occupations of time and space. We use our feelings to propose descriptions and undertake agreements that are intended to make the world, in fact, the way we want it to be. Writing descriptions down can be useful. For example, this conference has a code of conduct which is written down. Would it make sense to have a code of conduct that isn't written down? Perhaps, but the code of conduct refers to a procedure for dealing with incidents. It is also written down. What would happen if this procedure wasn't written down before an incident happened? People may complain that they were being treated harshly, and others may complain to reporters were being taken seriously. Furthermore, the documented procedure for handling incidents says, try to get as much of the incident in written form by the reporter. If you cannot, transcribe it for yourself as it was told to you. So writing descriptions down can be useful, but that's because you're converting private fact into a public fact, and we can all operate around such public facts. It's perhaps worth commenting that in Nazi Germany, under the principle of, under the, under the leader principle or Führer principle, rules tended to become oral rather than written. This is the blind faith in the leader that gives us weird team building events. It's no coincidence that the authorities in Nazi Germany allowed private corporations to keep their internal organisation, but with a simple renaming from hierarchy to Führer principle. That's essentially the environment within which the so-called self-organizing teamwork, professional software development, becomes something that is ordered and enforced, and therefore fails. But it's no coincidence that the Nazis failed in their bid for world domination. Fortunately, I can give a talk like this without fear of being arrested and disappeared by a mad secret police force. Sometimes, I feel that the arrival of written codes of conduct is perhaps more important 
for the togetherness we need to make working software an even the agile manifesto. My only complaint is that if I go into a room of people, I can expect everybody to know how to spend money in a shop. However, I can't be sure there will be anybody who knows how together to develop the process that we share. The process of exchange value is universal, but the process of development isn't. <coughs> Perhaps soon, in just the way this normal person is by now fully expected to know what a bank statement looks like and how to spend money, it will also be expected that every normal person knows that the way to approach developing a shared process is to describe and propose and agree and undertake. And if we could recognize each other as human process developers, in addition to transactors of exchange value, perhaps we can add more meaning to the idea of being a human being. By understanding that everything is an event, by giving your full attention to events, by seeing the world as Whitehead saw it, as a world of events, perhaps we can understand better the world we live in, become better human beings, and most of all, write better Python software. I would like to thank you all for your time and attention today. Thank you very much for listening. Thank you very much, John. I think we've got a few minutes for questions, if anybody has any. Are you saying that we have to agree a process and therefore freeze progress? You seem to say that once we've written down a process, we've acquired the, uh, the knowledge to do something like that. Does that stop us? Um, well, yeah, problem? this is the kind of thing I'm trying to address. So, for me, process is, is the sequence of actual happenings. And you can describe those things, and you can use those descriptions as proposals for other events. But the process itself is eventual. And writing a description is an event, but, and that might be your process, writing things down. But at some point, you've got to, you're going to be doing other things with people. I mean, writing software is writing things down in a way. But what do you write down? Do you all sit in your corners and just write whatever you want to write? Or do you have some coming together in which you have a discussion about maybe what the problem is and how you might involve that into a solution together? Because you need to have some kind of discussion and to bring the various contributors together with a sufficient togetherness that they can constitute an occasion of software development and a sufficient togetherness. <coughs> the records of that, which is the software, has the togetherness that allows it to be working. So we would agree to work on a piece of software, and you would encourage us to write down what our goals are, and then proceed to, uh, and maybe other rules that we need to guide us, and then off we go and generate events as we Run this process. Well, that's essentially what the Man Agile Manifesto and all of the different Agile proposals do. So if you want to ask what Scrum is, Scrum works because there's a Scrum guide. You know, so it's work because there's a Scrum guide. It's a description of how you do Scrum. You need to do all of it, otherwise you're not really doing Scrum. What they don't really say is that the only thing you can do with this description, that it's, they don't say it's just a description, confuse that description with the process as such, which is a kind of managerialism. Um, but they don't then tell you that the only thing you can do with this description, which is a fact, an event, a fact from somebody's writing, writing um, process, all you can do for that is have events, occasions of experience. We know from Whitehead, who's writing in the 1920s about this, that all of these events are unique. So that's the sip, that's just the world that we're in. And if you want to do things with people, you have to kind of suggest things with them, don't you? Otherwise, you're just doing something on your own, and so are they. So when I say description, I don't necessarily mean writing. You could say, let's get some fish and chips. I mean, that's a description, isn't it? And it's describing something you've perhaps done before, and you're taking that description and using it as a proposal for something that you're going to do together. I mean, you know, proposal could be marriage. <coughs> let's get married. You know, will you marry me? It's a proposal, isn't it? I mean, you may have done it before, you may not, but there's a, an idea that by saying that, you're suggesting that you come together in some event, marriage, an indivisible atomic event that couldn't happen without both of you being there. You know, and that bothness of coming together isn't irreducible. If you take one of them out, you don't have that wedding event anymore. There's 
and irreducibility to the multiplicity of, you know? So that's what I'm trying to just bring out, really. And I think it's, um, I just think it's curious that we don't actually, we don't all really know that that's kind of constraint we're operating in. Uh, so you're well, making it explicit that we go through this business of contracting to do things and then choosing to or not do them. And those de that generates a benefit generates further contracts and... Yeah, your response, it's like, um, it's like, you said in your keynote, the responsibilities that you have, that you can expect from other people, arise from people proposing things to each other and agreeing with what they do, and then you have to follow up on that, otherwise trust breaks down. And you build trust by, you know, trust is the kind of integration of delivering on what you said you were going to do, or more or less, or, or explaining why you didn't do that. Over time, it's the integration of those events. If you want to build trust, you have to do it eventually by having suggesting that I will, you know, I'll go and get you that drink. Or, you know, can you lend me your laptop? I mean, Ross just popped up with his laptop because I don't really particularly. So, so, you know, it's rather than like. Sorry, this sounds like an interesting discussion, but I'm afraid we are out of time this session. So, please, by all means, continue this outside. Please join me all again in thanking John for the